Well, hello once again, everybody. You guys are having too much fun out here during the little uh, intro there. Hey, just so you know who, what's going on, in case you're watching us right now, because later on we edit these down for just to have the sermon part. My name is Eric Bucci. I'm the lead pastor here at the Cornerstone Church. Can you guys do me a big, 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 big favor? Can you welcome everyone that's watching online? Give a big hello. Come on, you do better than that. So glad that you're here today. It's an honor that you're here today. And listen, we, we really do believe that God has good plans for every single person. And uh, God has a hope and a future. And we also believe this. And this is one of the most important things that I think about more and more. If we've had some situations in, of, of late of dear people that um, were with us. I don't know if you recognize what happened. But we had a dear sister uh, in the Lord, um, Cynthia um, Wallace. Uh, Coleman and Cynthia, if you know Coleman and Cynthia, a wonderful couple at our church, taught marriage like no one else could do. Amazing, amazing. And she did our growth track, and they were just an encouragement to everybody. She went home with the Lord last, I think it was uh, Sunday or Saturday night, uh, Sunday. Um, and, um, and so uh, it's with a heavy heart that I mentioned last week to pray. I didn't have liberty to pray, but... Um, and she went home with the Lord. And so I just ask you to pray for Coleman. If you don't know who that is, it's a wonderful, wonderful couple. And it breaks our heart. And as I think about that, and as I'm reading through the book of Job right now, uh, as we're going through the Bible in a year, if you're doing that with us, it just reminds us what's really important in life. And, and I will tell you, and one of the phrases that, that has come to me that I always hold on to is the best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. This is not heaven in this earth you will have trouble but take heart i have overcome the earth and so i want to encourage you with that and so uh, it's with that statement it's so true everybody as things get shaken a little bit where we're talking about the wilderness we're completing our series this day we're starting a new one next week but today we're talking about real bread for real hunger and and now as we go through wilderness times as we go through situations where the normal sustenance of life the normal procedure of life has been interrupted uh you're in a wilderness experience maybe you went through a death of a loved one or loss of a job maybe you went through a pandemic i don't know if anyone can relate to that uh yeah maybe you've gone through uh, all kinds of stuff and you go through these situations where the normal things of life are not what they used to be and for some people, this wilderness experience has been very difficult. The Bible has a lot to say about wilderness experiences. We've been talking about that. But today we're going to focus on, on about bread in the wilderness and about Jesus and a little bit of Moses and what it means and how you and I can persevere and find the bread, what we need to get through the wilderness and to thrive in the wilderness. Not just, not just survive, but to thrive in the wilderness. And so today we'll be talking about that a little bit, okay? So I wanted just to go ahead and bring your attention. Uh, we're going to focus on Moses, who was one of the greatest men that ever walked the planet, and how God had him in the wilderness for 40 years first, as he was a, an exile, as he, as he was a convict, if you will, had to flee and had to be a refugee from Egypt into the wilderness for 40 years, and then God called him to go back and be a deliverer for the Israel people. And, uh, and then he takes the Israelis... Israelites, excuse me, Israelis are the modern nation, Israelites, through the wilderness and what should have taken an 11-day journey from Kadesh Barnea took 40 years in the wilderness. And they learned a lot through the wilderness. And then Jesus later on, before he begins his ministry, begins in the wilderness as well for 40 days and 40 nights. And so here Moses is giving a, a summary as we talked about weeks ago he gave a summary of what was important for them to realize. That's what he says. He says, and he, that's God, humbled you and let you hunger and fed you through manna. Now, what's manna? Manna would be basically the actual Hebrew word for manna means, what is it? If you've ever grown up in a household, maybe your mother or your father has made you something, you're like, what is it? My mother tried to fool us when I was growing up, gave us liver and onions and called it steak. I said, what is it? That's not steak. Well, that's what happened to the Israelites. They ate this thing called manna. And what happened was this. It would show up in the morning when it was still 
morning, before the afternoon sun came, it would melt it away. They would go in the morning and collect these little wafer type things and they could make their kind of bread. And it was supernatural because they ate this bread. It says in the Bible that no one got sick. Their feet did not swell. Their clothes did not wear out. God took care of them, but they complained because they got tired of being in quarantine. They got tired of being in the wilderness. And so God gave them this manna. All right? Now, this is what Moses was saying. There's a reason why God did what he did. And he humbled you and let you hunger. It let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. In other words, God did something different in the wilderness. Maybe God is doing something different in the wilderness right now that you're not aware of. Many of us perhaps have awakened to the point, wow, I'm with my family all the time. I didn't know I had a family like this. I didn't know I was married to him or her. I didn't know these kids were this way. And, and you're learning things in the wilderness and, and that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone. Not to say that the things that we normally have are bad, but man lives by every word. And by the way, and it says man, woman, or man, right? But man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. To understand there is a daily necessity of having a word from the Lord. Daily having a word from the Lord. Let me just tell you a little story uh, that happened to me yesterday. Uh, yesterday I went to a place in, uh, I'm not going to mention the lake. I went to a little lake and I went early in the morning. And normally the gate is open, but the gate was closed. And I saw there was a car at the gate blocking the gate. So I was kind and wise enough not to do that. So I decided, well, I'm going to pull a little ahead of the gate, out of the way of the gate. And I parked my car there. And I went into the woods. And yeah, I'm so spiritual. You know, give me a big round of applause. Yeah, I went to the wilderness. I went into the, to the, um, along the lake, took a chair out, read my Bible, prayed, thought about you, prayed about the church, prayed about our service today, spent time with God. I was there for a couple of hours or, or more. And I came out of the woods because it started getting busy. People started coming. I don't like it. People were there. So I walked out of the woods and I was looking for my car. And my chariot disappeared. I could not find my car. I'm like, oh boy. And I asked around, oh, by the way, oh, a police officer came and towed you away. So, because I'd spent time with the Lord in the woods, I actually was okay with it. So I called and I found out that there's a police took the car, and so I said, why did they take the car away? Because she couldn't find you. So the, the police officer made an hour after, made their way, because Sandra was away, and the squad car came, and I told her, blue lives matter. I told her, <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said, blue lives matter. <clears throat> anyhow, so anyhow, I was really happy, and, and I was like, okay, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not get upset about this. And she says, We're, they, you have to pay $150. Okay, God, I, I came here to pray. I came here to be spiritual, and I came to pray in the woods, and this is what happens to me. So I proceeded to go in back of the squad car, and there was a cage, and I, I was in bars, and <laughs> I was on the 6 o'clock news. Did you see me? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Actually, I was on the good side. She said, well, we, I have you on the good side. That's the bad side. The bad side had the bars. I had the open window, but you can't open the window, and the plexiglass. And so they, she drove me to the wrecker that took the vehicle, and, uh, and I, I was like, Lord, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be cool about this because I just spent time in the woods today, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be upset. And so I was very kind to her. I said, I'm not quite sure, ma'am, uh, miss, excuse me, officer, uh, why you did what you did. There was no sign, and I was going on and on. Anyhow, went on and ended up talking to her about God a little bit and talked about various things. I said, it's a good thing I was praying in the woods. I told her that. I said, I'm a lot more patient than I would normally be. And then she drops me off at the wrecker, and I had a chance to, to talk to the gentleman that owned the shop, and through God's grace, I got him down to $50. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I prayed for him. <clears throat> Anyhow, I got my car back. Everything's fine. But the reason I say that for is not so I can, uh, well, Pastor, why'd you park such a foolish place? Okay, I learned my lesson. But the thing I'm trying to let you know is this, that when you spend time with the Lord, you have power that you normally don't have. I, I'll be honest with you. If, if I didn't have the time with the Lord, I would have been pretty fit to be tied. I might have been in the 6 o'clock and the 11 o'clock news and the morning news program. 
But I, I kept cool. But, you know, sometimes you need those times with the Lord because he gives you the strength you need for every situation. Now, I understand compared to other people around the world, big deal. But the point I'm going to bring you is I had time with the Lord in the morning. And the Bible says that the manna would go away in the afternoon sun. I'm telling you right now, if you don't get your time with the Lord, the afternoon sun of busyness, of all sorts of things, will occupy and take your time until you are out of sustenance. It's so important in the beginning of the day to give the God, give God the best and the first part of your day, even if it's five or ten minutes. I'm telling you, everybody. And so man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that continually comes forth from the God to begin to do that. And then we have Jesus who spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, remember, command these stones into loaves of bread. So he was hungry and the enemy said, turn these loaves into, into stones of bread. I'm sorry, turn, turn these stones into loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written. He actually quoted the word. And he is the word, quoted the word. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that continually, that's the actual breaking down of the Greek verb tense, that continually comes from the mouth of God, present tense. Not past tense, present tense. That God's word is always going forth, if we'll listen. And he says, man does not live by bread alone. So what's important? What's important is to live on the daily word of God. Now, I believe, and I really do believe this, I believe that we are heading into some interesting times. Have you noticed? I don't believe, I'm not one of these people that say the sky is falling, the sky is falling. I'm not one of these guys that likes to cry, cry wolf all the time because no one takes you seriously. I'm not saying, I don't, I honestly, with the Lord's help, I don't believe this is the end. I do not believe it. But I believe it's a sign of things to come, signs of things to come. And I do believe, as John the Baptist said, the ax has been laid at the root of the trees. Before you cut a tree down, from my understanding, because I would never try to do such a thing, you actually, you actually, or when you do a nail, what do you do? You tap it lightly to make a mark where the nail is, right? So you can really pound it in. I believe that we are being tapped for the end times. And I believe we need to get ready. Now, is it gonna happen in 20 months, 20 days, 20 years? I don't know. But you can see the signs coming. And if you're not careful, you can get lost in the signs and forget the one who gives us the signs. If you're not careful, you can get lost in what's taking place and lose who we're living for. So anyhow, he said, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, you need to live for. Now, when I think about that, this is a very good illustration about that, every word that comes from the mouth of God. You think that the mouth of the mother is bringing food to these little birds, right? And there's opening their mouths and they are, look, look how anxious and how dependent they are upon their mother. All of them, they're singing worship songs, by the way, but they're, they're sitting there and they're like this, feed me, feed me, and they're depending on everything that comes from the mother's mouth. My friends, this is the position we are to learn to live in with God. If we're going to get through any kind of day, if you're going to get through the loss of a loved one, if you're going to get through the end times, if you're going to get through loss of a job or whatever happens on this planet we must know the secret to longevity is sustenance and the most important sustenance we have is spiritual sustenance because you are a spiritual being trapped in a biological body and my friends this is the attitude we are to have every word is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of the lord and do we even take the time to sit on the branch? Do we even take the time to open our mouths instead of speaking, receiving? And today I want to talk to you a little bit about that and how we can overcome that. What do you do when you've done everything you can do with no changes? And what used to work does not work anymore. What do you do when you're trying to get over an addiction? Maybe you're struggling with an addiction. I don't know what it is. It really doesn't make a difference what it is. Whether it's heroin or whether it's donuts, I don't know. I call them do nots. They're not donuts, they're do nots, unless it's Krispy Kreme. And I'm in the South, and the hot light says fresh. Did you, who remember, how many remember those days? 
when they had police officers, that's when they were good, when they were directing traffic to Krispy Kreme I, and not towing, your to- not towing your car away. But do you remember that? Okay, you got me started here, okay? What do you do when you've done everything you can do with no changes? So what used to work does not work anymore. You can't get over that a food addiction. You can't get over that situation. You can't get over the, whatever it is. You have that marriage. You have that depression. You have whatever you have. It's just something you can't seem to overcome. And, and you thought by now I, I'd get good for a couple of years and here I am again. What do you do when that happens? Well, there's a situation that took place in the narrative of Matthew which talks about a story in which the disciples, Jesus would send his disciples out two by two, and they would go out to the towns before him and kind of soften the ground, if you will, before he came. He gave him authority to cast out demons and to heal the sick. And here's a narrative of what took place. Okay, let's go ahead and read it. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, that being Jesus, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely For he often falls into the fire, often, and into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. All right? So basically, pretty clear, right? So what does Jesus say as a result of that? Then Jesus answered and said, his disciples are right there, by the way. How many of you like being corrected in front of other people? How many people like to have a boss that actually corrects you in front of the other employees? I never do that to my children. Then Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse. A little bit extreme there. Faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and came it out of him. And Oh, very sorry. Then the disciples came to Jesus afterwards, right, privately. Jesus rebuked them openly. It's like, let's go to him privately, because they don't want another what for in front of other people. So the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? Good question. Lord... Okay, what, what, what happened, Jesus? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for we must believe he exists. And he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Well, how do, how do I do this, Jesus? And Jesus gives him a story and tells him a, about the mustard seed and how if you have the, a faith of a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be lifted up and pulled into the sea. And Jesus says, just take the faith that you have and multiply the faith that you have. And I'll tell you, whatever faith you have, everybody, exercise what you have. But then he goes on and says something else. However, this kind does not go out except by what? Prayer and fasting. Sometimes you have to pull out the big guns, and I'm not talking literally. I'm talking spiritually. Sometimes you get to a place where you've tried everything, you've done everything, and there is an opportunity and you can't seem to break through. I am not having success. I need to do something to break things up. And sometimes what we need to do is pull ourselves aside and fast and pray. Prayer and fasting. And so we're going to begin that tomorrow, 21 days, which we'll get into in a few moments. So what was the problem with the disciples? What was the issue they had? Well, Jesus tells them. He says this. He says, he answers that, oh, faithless. Faithless and perverse generation. So they had a lack of faith. So we want to build ourselves in our most holy faith. Faith comes by what? And hearing by the what? Word of the Lord. Remember that. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word. You see, it's the word of God that gives us strength. And so we'll talk more about that. The lack of faith. The second thing was and uh, oh, faithless and perverse generation. So they were what? They were, had lack of faith and they were connected with the world more than they were with God. Could it be that you and I are too connected to the world and not connected enough to God? Could it be that we seek the things of the world more than the things of God? And w- when I think of the Israelites in the desert, I don't know if you remember the story but Moses took a little while on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. The people were getting kind of a, kind of, man, where is it? We need somebody to, we need a God to lead us. We need something we can see, feel, touch, and donate to. So they made a golden calf. Aaron gave in 
to the, to the people and turn the worship of God. They called the golden calf, by the way, they called it Yahweh. <laughs> they called it the name of the Lord and made a different faith. I think sometimes we do the same thing in church, don't we? We actually make God into something we like. Why? They wanted to, they were connected to the ways of the world more than the ways of the Lord. And if we're not careful, we can begin to make statues for God. We can make a elephant statue. Or we can make a donkey statue. Or we can look to government to do only what God can do. We can look to a political candidate. We can look to someone, a job market. We can look into the economy. And we begin to make gods out of the very things that would take us down. And this is what happened to the disciples. They were too connected to the things of this earth. And their faith was low. Well, what do you do then? How do we overcome? One of the ways we overcome the battle is one before the battle. You need to understand that, everybody. The best way to win the battle is preparation. Preparation is so important so you can respond to a crisis instead of react. I will say that yesterday. I'm proud of myself. Can I be proud of myself for a few moments? I actually responded and didn't react. Now, the day before, that's another question. But the battle is won before the battle. So if you take time building your most holy faith, you can respond to circumstances instead of react. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We talked about this. And after fasting 40 days, he took time to fast and to pray. He basically fought the battle before the battle. He ba- Bottom line, your biggest enemy is yourself. Right? The one you really have to battle is not your boss. Not your children, not your parents, not your louse, excuse me, not your spouse. I'm just joking, I shouldn't have said that. Your spouse is not a louse. Don't you dare say that again. No, but you, the battle is you, everybody. And so you understand that. And he actually battled against the things of him. The enemy utilized his proclivities and things that would tempt him, though he did not fall into it. And so sometimes what happens during this fasting spirit of time, you might find things that will come to the surface. Praise God. It's an opportunity. So, how do we overcome? The battle's won before the battle. Prayer and fasting is the great work before the great work happens. You can see it in the most monumental things in Scripture. You can see it in the book of Esther, where we just read through how Esther fasted and prayed and asked all the Jewish people to fast and pray before she went to the king. You can see fasting and prayer, even through, um, you can see it happening through Jesus. You can see it happening through Elijah. You can see it happening throughout the scriptures. We'll see fasting and prayer to give greater power and strength. Jesus tells us to do that. People would say, why pray? Isn't God going to do what he's going to do? So why even bother? Right? You've heard that, right? It almost sounds very like um, what will be is what will be. You know, what will be, what will be. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Existentialism. We have no control. It's not true, everybody. People say, well, prayer changes us, but it doesn't change God. That's partially true. But there's something about prayer that I want to share with you, share with you today and remind you. We pray to God because he is faithful and he's unchanging. Okay, that's a good thing. God is unchanging. If God's unchanging, then why pray to him? I guess we need to change. No, hang on. We're not done yet. For the Lord, for I am the Lord, I do not change. So what he did in the past, he'll do again. But I like what Chuck Smith says, the founding pastor of Calvary, uh, which is a movement in California that came around the world. Prayer does not change the purpose of God, but prayer does change the action of God. That is extremely clear throughout Scripture. For example, we have two basic wills of God. You have God's sovereign will. Okay, I call it the MC Hammer will. Can't touch this. Okay, You never heard of Prophet MC Hammer? Okay. He's actually a pastor, by the way. Yeah, can't touch this. It was a great song. Do not look it up now, but play on the way home. Say, so, sovereign will of God. What does that mean? God, you can't touch it. It's God's will. He's going to come back. He's going to judge people. He's going to make things right. God is going to do what he's going to do, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's called a sovereign will. You can't touch that one at all. That's the sovereign will of God, okay? But there's another will of God, and it's his permissive, I call it the flex will. In other words, there's a will. He wants all men and women to be saved, and that's why he's slow in his coming so that more people will come to know Christ. 
So God has, he wants everyone to come to faith, right? So there's his permissive will, but people have a choice. And so he wants everyone to come to faith. So we have this permissive will, and you and I can tap into that permissive will. And if we don't pray and we don't act, things don't happen. In fact, the Bible says you do not have what you want because you do not ask God. In other words, there's a lot of answers to prayers that are not happening because you and I are not accessing them. I heard a great story from uh, prayer Jabez. is an illustration how a man went to heaven and St. Peter was showing him around. This is obviously an illustration. There's not truth in it. But St. Peter was showing him around and said, what, is, what are those things over there? Oh, you don't want to go over there. What are, those are warehouses. Warehouses of what? <clears throat> of uh, prayers that could have been answered if people were asked. He says, where's my warehouse? <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to go there. And he showed him a huge warehouse. Listen, everybody, there's so many things you have not because you ask not. And you ask for a wrong motives. But a much of what happens depends on the prayer. Do you realize that, that the course of this nation and the world is dependent upon the prayers and the actions of the church? We have to stop abrogating our responsibility and start taking responsibility for what is before us. So pray to the Lord, who is in charge of the harvest, ask him to send more workers into his fields. Why did Jesus ask his disciples to say that? Because there is this flex will, permissive will. We have to reach into heaven, ask God for it, believe in faith, and then connect, to, uh, connect earth with it. Even Jesus had a hard time getting enough help. And the truth is, there's enough work out there, but the problem is those laborers, right? And Jesus says, pray to the Lord, ask him. And then we can also, I like what this, God cannot and will not change his character. Please understand that. You cannot make God a bad God. He is who he is. But according to scripture, he can and will change his mind. I thought God changed, if not, he doesn't change his character. But you can see throughout scripture, he does change his mind. And you'd say, well, he knew he was going to do ahead at any time. Well, what, whatever you want to say. You can see throughout Scripture that men and women pray, and when they pray, God acts. Prayer and fasting is a very powerful thing. So, for example, you can see, I don't know if you realize what happened to the Israelites. The Israelites were in the wilderness. They made that golden calf we talked about, right? Mary talked about that golden calf. Yeah. But in, and God says, leave me alone. It basically, if you've ever been on vacation, with kids in a car, in a long, long thing, if you ever stopped the car and looked at your spouse and said, we need to do something about these kids. Your kids, they're not my kids. <laughs> it got to a point where it got so bad, God says, leave me alone, I'm gonna wipe them out. And what did Moses say? Something extraordinary. I, frankly, guys, I love you guys, and uh, maybe I'll die for some people, but you know what Moses said? He says, if you do not say these people, blot me out of your book. Listen, I love everybody. I'm not going to go to hell for anybody. Moses says, blot me out of your book if you cannot say these people. You know what the Bible says? So the Lord, go ahead, changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring on his people. You can see Abraham, the father of our faith. He was negotiating with God about Sodom and Gomorrah and his, and his nephew Lot. You can also see throughout Scripture, you can see in Amos, uh, one of the minor prophets. Uh, minor, they call it minor because they have shorter books. But this is the longest of the minor prophets. So in my vision, the locust ate every green plant in sight. The economy went down. Then I said, oh, sovereign Lord, please forgive us or we will not survive. Uh, Lord, forgive our country and how we are behaving, right? For Israel is small, so the Lord relented from his plan. God changed his mind. And then there was another thing he prayed about, and God changed his mind again. Then I said, oh, sovereign Lord, please stop. We will not survive. Israel so small. Then the Lord relented from his plan to do. I will not do that either, said the sovereign Lord. Let, let me explain a little bit what, how this works through prayer. You see, in many ways, uh, this kingdom of God is like the military. Please understand, I'm not trying to make the church militaristic, but there's a lot of parallels. You and I are the ground troops. We're the boots on the ground. We are on the theater of war. There's different branches of the military. We're the ground troops. You have the Air Force. You have the intelligence, right? You have, the, you have all these other different things. So what you and I will do is when we pray, 
We're like calling up and saying, I need help. I'm at 30 degrees north, 15, whatever it is. I need help here. Will you please soften the target? And then the Air Force or the Marines or someone will come with and they'll shoot a missile or something and soften the target so you can get through it. So you have to communicate real time with the other parts of the military. When you and I pray, what we are doing, we're communicating with the spiritual realm, asking God to send us help. And like the military, that will send a reconnaissance or send more troops or send bombs or you name it. That's what happens in the spirit. So you and I are actively participating in it. Then the Lord relented from his plan. I will not do that other, says the sovereign Lord. So what does fasting in prayer do as we begin to wrap this up today? Number one, it changes us. The best thing we can do is ask God to change us. Another thing it does Helps, helps tune your hearing and direction. We get these throughout Scripture, even in the New Testament times, in the book of Acts, that while they were worshiping the Lord, and I've heard people in church, while they're worshiping the Lord, God gives them ideas. While I'm worshiping the Lord, the Lord will give me direction for my family. I'm not even looking for that, right? While they were worshiping the Lord, and what? Fasting. The Holy Spirit said, maybe some of you need to hear the Holy Spirit say, Set apart from me but Barnabas and Saul for the work of the which I'll call them. Then they fasted and prayed and they went forth. It changes us. It helps us a hearing direction. It aligns us with God's will. Do you know what happens when you pray God's will? And this is the confidence that we have, everybody. That if we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, but you have to know his will first. We align our will to his will. He hears us and, and we know that if he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we've asked for. And we can change God's actions. Case in point, one of my favorite people in the Bible, Daniel. Daniel, a man of God who was in a foreign land, Nebuchadnezzar, and then the Persians later on. He suffered a lot, but he prayed. He was a, he was a man that prayed for the prosperity of the culture he was involved with. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. That's 21 days. I ate no delicacies. No meat or wine entered my mouth. Nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. So he took 21 days to focus, to pray. Other points of time when he prayed, the angel said, came and said, the moment you prayed, I came forth, but there was a battle in the heavenlies. Do you not realize that there's a battle in the heavenlies that's beyond what you see? The stuff you see in our culture today is just the bottom part. What really happens is in the heavenlies, you and I need to be about prayer and fasting. What would happen if we spent more time on the Word than social media? Oh! What would happen instead of posting the latest, greatest political commentator if we quoted Scripture? What happens if we spent more time knowing about the Word of God instead of conjecture? I venture to say there'll be revival in the church. My friends, we need to seek after God while He may be found. And Hosea, what a book of the Bible that is. He says something very important to us, and I pray that you and I would do this. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Listen, we need God in our families. We need God in our church. We need God in our state. We need God in our country. Listen, the times are coming. I told you several years ago, there'd be burning and there'd be riots in the streets. If you remember, I told you that. Not because of me, but I, I think I've heard from the Lord. There's going to be more. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready spiritually? Not just with the ballot box, but the heart box. How is your heart box? Break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord. We need to pray. Do you realize the course of this country is dependent upon the church praying and walking it out? Don't waste your energy 
on other people, spend your energy not fighting each other over nuances of different belief systems, but focus on the scriptures and walk it out and pray. Break up your fallow ground. You and I have hard hearts. The only way C can germinate is you have to break up. I appreciate, by the way, the tomatoes you are sending us. I do not appreciate the, uh, the squash, however. <laughs> you can keep the squash. But you got to break up the ground, and then you plant a seed. Fasting and prayer is like bringing your car for a tune-up, putting yourself on a lift, changing your oil, changing your brakes, getting the alignment right. We need to put ourselves periodically on the lift. There are times that you and I need to break up our hearts so we can receive that what God has for us. We have hardened hearts. Here's something really profound. You don't know what you don't know until you know what you don't know. And one of the ways that happens is through fasting and prayer. You can't have change without breaking. Breaking out of our routine, everybody. I'm going to encourage you to do that. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. Don't work just for material possessions. Don't just work for the latest paycheck, but work for things that matter, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said this, I am the bread of life. The temptation in the wilderness turned these stones. Jesus is the stone we stand on. He's also the bread that we feast upon. And next week we're beginning a new series. I'm excited about it. The power that comes through communion. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you eaten the bread of him? He's the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. Buddha will not get you there. Allah will not get you there. Confucius will not get you there. No other religion will get you. Every religion in the world has to go to the feet of Jesus. He is the only bridge. He is the only way. Have you met Jesus? Have you given your life to Jesus? I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to do that. If you want to bow your head, close your eyes. Just out of reverence for other people. You do it at home as well. Listen, none of us have what it takes, but Jesus laid down his life, paid for our sins, paid the price so you could have access to him by dying on the cross, paying for everything you've ever done wrong. And if you'll put your faith in him and believe in him and give your life to him, today you can become a child of God knowing that you'll be with him in heaven. Because there's a place called hell, eternal separation from God, a place of burning, a place of destruction. All you have to do is look around the world and see where they're suffering. And that, my friends, is a little bit of a hors d'oeuvre of what hell is like. I'm gonna ask you to pray and connect, connect a prayer with your heart. Lord Jesus, go ahead in your own way. Lord Jesus, if you wanna pray, if you've fallen away from God or maybe you've never given God your life, today's the day. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you died and arose again from the dead. I ask you right now to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And I choose, with your help, to turn away from what I know is wrong. And most importantly, today, I choose to step down from being in charge of my life. This is no longer my life. I surrender my life to you. Take it. And I'll follow you the best way I can in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, we believe you got born again. Which simply means you're a child of God. Not on the merit of what you've done, but on the merit of what you received. Jesus. And I encourage you, if you want to help in with this new, um, new pathway, you can text BEGIN to 94090. Or tell someone at the front desk afterwards or see me afterwards. We'd love to help you along the path in what's going to happen. I don't have a long time right now. I just want to mention a few things. We are beginning this breaking up fallow ground tomorrow. 21 days of fasting and prayer. We're going to ask you to participate with us. Take time. Every day we're meeting at 6 a.m. You can go online or you can be here in person if you like. That's what's going to be happening. And there's different types of fasting and prayer you can do. One way is a total fast, water only. Ask your doctor about that one. 
you're going to have any medical conditions. Number two, a partial fast. Maybe fruits and vegetables only. No sweets and no meats. Does that include popcorn? Uh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Number three, a Daniel fast. 21 days like Daniel did. Here's one we could all probably do. It's time for us maybe to get flip phones. <laughs> get off social media how about we don't watch the news agencies or all these people that are saying all sorts of things it wouldn't kill you to turn off the news for 21 days choose one of those as you walk out of here there's a, uh, a wristband that says 21 days I encourage you to take time to put yourself on a lift and let God give you an oil change get a tune up in your spirit because my friends days are coming we need to be able to respond and not react. And the only way you're going to respond is you're, you're, you're responding to God on a daily basis. You will know what to do in difficult times. Hey, as we conclude today, I want to mention, I forgot in the last service to do this. There are four different ways you can give, actually five different ways you can give. If you're here today, there's boxes at the end. As you walk out of here today, you want to drop your tithe and offering. You don't have to give. You get to give. And let me tell you something so true. God will supply your needs, not your greeds. If you trust him, what he's entrusted you with, with your tithes and your offerings. You can text to 77977 and you can give that way. You can also use our Push Pay app, which you can see in the app store. I don't have time today to explain that. You have cornerstonecheshire.com or you can snail mail it, which simply means a postal system. It might take for us a while to get for us to get it, but we'll get it. You can do it that way too. That was a joke. Okay. Well, we thank you so much, everybody, for watching today and for participating and be a part of our service today. We do have growth track at one o'clock. Uh, let me be honest with you. I miss hanging outside with you guys. I think we're going to put some tables outside for next week so we can at least be outside and social distance a little more. Miss not seeing you guys. God bless you. Listen, let's walk together. Let's feast on the Lord. Let's fast. Let's pray. Let's, let's see things change by God changing us and utilizing us to be the couriers of hope and love and true change. Amen, everybody? God bless you guys. Thank you so much for being a today. You're dismissed. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.